The bright side of addiction is recovery, and recovery begins with hope. Welcome, everyone. If you are new to our podcast, we welcome you. And if you've been here before, by golly, we welcome you back. Hey, if you're in recovery or know or love someone who is or simply want to know more about the recovery process, or maybe you're a bit concerned about someone you know or love who is harmfully using alcohol or any other drug, this is the podcast for you as we carry the message of hope and the promise of recovery. And a reminder that you can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. Recent episodes have featured interviews with actor John Lorquette, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, musician Bonnie Raitt, authors Brene Brown and Lamont J.A. Jantz, former NFL players Ryan Leaf and Thomas Hollywood Henderson, plus an archived interview that I did with Betty Ford 41 years ago. All these interviews and more are on our website, plus conversations with everyday people in long-term recovery, sharing their story, their insight, their path. Now, in this edition of Recovery Coast to Coast, we're going to head into nature as well as into nurture. Well, I'll have a conversation with an award-winning wildlife photographer. His name is Brad Orstad. He's a man who traveled down the darkest of roads in the most desolate of places. His young daughter, just a year and three months old, died tragically following an overnight stay with his mother under mysterious circumstances. And while in the wild, he faced death twice, coming face to face with a giant grizzly bear on one occasion and a wild mountain lion on another, all while trying to figure out a way to stop drinking, which was also killing him slowly but surely. Here's a quick clip from today's interview. I got sober on September 4th, 2018, and, and that following December on the 15th, um, I had probably my wildest solo experience, and I, I caught some fresh mountain lion tracks and walked this big male down. He was drinking out of a creek, so he didn't, didn't hear me. When he turned around, we, we locked eyes. I kind of wondered <laughs> what he was going to do. He just kind of turned around and sauntered off. He never even looked back, which after I consulted some, some books on cougar ecology and stuff, that's a sign of a really confident animal that he's like, I'm not even worried about you picture boy. Like I, I don't even, I don't even give you a second look. No, I say, last I saw was his tail flick and disappear over this rise. And I knew that was a gift for me. That was very, very early on in my recovery. And I was white knuckling it. And I had those little wild moments. I saw that grace and that power and that raw wildness and that I wanted that for my life. My conversation with Brad Orsted is coming right up. And later in the podcast, we'll hear from the iconic actor Sir Anthony Hopkins reflecting on his long-term recovery. I also want to let listeners know that there's a brand new musical on Broadway. It's a remake of the classic Days of Wine and Roses. I've included a review of that in the show notes. I'm Neil Scott, host of Recovery Coast to Coast, so thankful and filled with immense gratitude that you've chosen our podcast to listen to. There's a lot of podcasts on recovery out there, and I'm blessed and honored that you have chosen ours. Our website, by the way, is recoverycoasttocoast.org. And a little background, following 17 years of nightly broadcasting on iHeartRadio in Seattle, our podcast, which is coming up on three years old, features interviews with everyday people in recovery as well as clinicians and authors, recovering celebrities, those who offer the promise of hope and the reality of recovery. Plus, well-vetted resources for individuals, families, and friends. We invite you to enjoy it and to share it with your friends as well. Recovery is an American way of life. A reminder, our email address is recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net, and we'd love to hear from you. Recovery Coast to Coast, sponsored by Sundown M Ranch, one of America's oldest, least expensive, and most successful treatment programs. Is there someone you know or love who made a New Year's resolution to stop drinking or using other drugs only to break the resolution in short order? Well, the intention was commendable, but the reality obviously different. Why? Because alcoholism and other drug addiction is a brain disease. And simple willpower will not get the job done. So in many cases, professional treatment is needed. 
That's where Sundown M Ranch comes in. They have been successfully treating addictive disease for over 55 years, treating individuals and family members. Unlike many treatment programs that focus on the financial bottom line, Sundown M Ranch is different. Treatment is certainly not free, but their rates are among the lowest in the country. There are a number of reasons for this, including the fact that they are a not-for-profit treatment program. Their bottom line is long-term recovery for each patient. They can keep their rates as low as possible because, well, they own their own land. Beautiful, by the way. 30 acres at the mouth of the Yakima River Canyon in central Washington. And they take most insurance plans. Their motto is, the patient is the reason that we are here. And they don't just treat and release. They follow each patient after their inpatient treatment, presenting them with the tools necessary for long-term recovery and helping them acclimate back into their respective communities. Treatment is hard, no doubt about it, but their outstanding treatment team is ready to help the person get on the road to long-term recovery. So if you're considering addiction treatment for yourself, a friend, a loved one, definitely do your research by all means and include Sundown M Ranch on your list. Sundown, where recovery begins. Sundown.org. All right, time for some coffee, at least for me, and some conversation. I invite you to join me, if you'd like, with your favorite beverage as I share a conversation that I had recently with Brad Orsted, an award-winning wildlife photographer, documentary producer, and the author of a gripping tale of tragedy and resilience, of life, death, and recovery. Here is that conversation. You know, a number of listeners of Recovery Coast to Coast have contacted me recently and suggested that I get in touch with a guy by the name of Brad Orsted. Uh, I was unfamiliar with Brad, but boy, I sure am familiar with him now. He's written a book called Through the Wilderness, uh, published by St. Martin's Press, and the writing is picturesque. Now, Brad's a wildlife filmmaker, four years in recovery. He shares his story in his writing and as part of his long-term recovery. He works and shares with special needs kids. Uh, he works with combat veterans, helping them to connect with the healing nature that healed him. You know, some might say it was an unconventional recovery, but I firmly believe there are many paths to long-term recovery. Brad found his in the vastness of nature. And while there's significant research to suggest a hereditary link to addiction, it's also possible to drink and drug yourself into addiction, as was the case with Brad following the tragic death of his daughter, Marley, at the age of a year and three months. Let's begin in the here and now. Brad, first of all, thank you so much for being a guest on Recovery Coast to Coast. What is it like for Brad four years since the beginning of your recovery? How's life for you now? Well, my goodness, um, let me just say it's such an honor to be on your show, and thank you so much for, for everything you've done over the years for everyone. So it's, it's much appreciated. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, five years now, actually, Neil, as of September wow. 4th uh, la last year. So I feel like I'm, I feel like I can say I moved into to long term recovery now. And it's a, it's a beautiful place. How is life different for you today? It's completely different. It's, it's such a 180 from when I was trapped in trauma and kind of kept myself trapped there by self medicating. You know, I've been able to over those five years, I've been able to to write this memoir and, and in the process of writing that was, was a big part of my healing. You know, I had to, I wrote every word of that book over and over and over again, sober. So I had to revisit those. I had to go back to the, to the battlefield uh, sober this time and relive that stuff. And so it, it's been a huge part of, of my recovery and my healing and, and processing. And before I would have never had the courage or the wherewithal to do that when I was using. Do you have a support system around you today? Yeah, I have I have a wonderful support system around me today. And, you know, Neil, that's the only way I really got sober. I tried like so many alcoholics numerous times before. Was it Mark Twain? I think he said that quitting smoking is easy. I've done it hundreds of times. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, it's kind of how I was with with recovery. And it wasn't until I had a 
pro Indian family that had kind of taken me in, me that were in long term recovery and, and helped me. And then I, you know, I put my check myself into treatment. I went to AA meetings. I did. I just I was voracious for anything that I thought could help me on my journey, whether I needed to read it or, or live it or attend it or um, I was all in. And so I would have never done it without that support. You went to a, a Native American sweat lodge as part of that, correct? Tell me about that. Yeah, in 2012, it was just a couple of years after we had had lost lost Marley. Really, just almost two years uh, to to the month. And I had been invited over to a um, it's called Crow Fair here at Crow Agency Montana. It's a celebration of of Native ways every every August. And there's around 1,500 teepees set up and all kinds of tribes and dancing and relays and just a wonderful time. And I so I was new here and I was had been invited over and. Um, as I said, I was even back then. I knew I was looking for things to to help me. One of my good friends was uh, adopted crow, and he took me over and introduced me to to his crow family. And I had asked to go into a sweat, and and he said, you know, when we were over there, he he talked to a guy and told him my situation. It's not something they typically bring strangers into, and I was a complete stranger. And, and of course, once um, anyone, especially a dad, hears about it, another dad losing a daughter, that they want to do everything they can. And that was really my first experience in that. It was so wonderful and it was so appreciative. And I wish I could say that it fixed me right then and there, but that was the beginning of my journey, not the end. Marley died tragically at the home of your mother on her first overnight. An unimaginable horror, unspeakable trauma. How painful was it, Brad, to revisit all of that grief on the pages of your book you know it was uh it was a tough one you know honestly i was also going through a divorce at that time and living in a camper next to my friend's house not you know unsure even where my life was all i had was my recovery and that manuscript and so i just poured everything into it and i just got into a system of five things or so every day i mean i would eat fish write have tacos do it again, just every, every day, like just this routine. And, and through that, hitting the page and then hitting some nature, whether it be fishing in the Yellowstone River or hiking, I tried to balance it, Neil. You know, you can only let so much of that in, and then I'd have to kind of go burn it off. I would have never had the, the wherewithal to do that had it not been for recovery and, and, and sobriety. If I would have tried to go back to that battlefield, if I would have drank again, I'd, you know, like what we say, I, I know I have one more drunk in me, but I don't know that I have one more sober in me. And I, I don't think I'd have come back. And I, I had to do it sober and, and alone. I spent 99% of my time alone. And I just, I needed that time to just try to find a place for everything. It's not going anywhere. I just, I had to, to find where, where it's going to live in me. When you hit your bottom or certainly near your bottom, uh, as you write in the book, at one point you were, gosh, you were plotting your own suicide and the murder of your mother, who you blame for Marley's death. Is is your relationship with your mother still non-existent? And did you ever find the truth? You know, we, after, you know, investigation and an autopsy and, you know, everything, we, we still don't know what happened. And I think that's what haunted me the most. And, you know, to lay there and concoct these murder-suicide plans. I mean, I would go to bed, lay down at 10 o'clock at night. And my mind would start racing. and I would literally hear the birds start chirping. And I'm like, did I just lay here for seven hours thinking about this? And I have to get up and, and go face the day. And, you know, it wasn't so much my hurt that I was mad about. It was the hurt I saw my my wife and our other two daughters. You know, the hurt I saw my dad, his only grandchild. You know, the, the just not knowing what Marley's life could have been or what she could have been or how all the what ifs and Boy, it just ground at me, and you know, I felt guilty um, for trusting her, and so I, I was mad at myself as much as I was mad at everybody else and the whole world and God and, and everything. And you know, we still we don't have any kind of relationship anymore. And I, I made it clear early on, you know, several years after when there'd been some attempted communication, and said, "Look, if you just tell us what tell us what happened, there's no way you're not going to get charged now. You're not going to get you know, it's all over. Everything's done." And you just tell us what happened and she just refuses, refused to, you know, there was so many different stories. None of them made sense. And we just never got the truth. And so I kind of just said, you know, if you're not willing to give me that, then I'm not willing to extend the olive branch anymore. And all this time later, it, what happened really doesn't even matter. It did 
seemed like it did, you know, initially, but it doesn't really matter anymore you know, what happened. As you were trying to get sober, trying to get stay alive, you, you didn't want to live and you didn't want to die, a, a number of people tried to help you. And, and there was a, a family doctor, and there's a great line in your book. You say a family doctor had a tear in his eye and a prescription pad in his hand dishing out opioids, trying to help you through the valley of depression and despair and ongoing addiction. You put some time together and then it didn't work. And then it it was an uphill battle for you the whole time. Uh, you talk of drinking from a cocktail of sadness and grief and trying to, to navigate all of that. It was, uh, it just mind blowing. Yeah, it was, it was a journey, uh, for sure. You know, one, one step forward and and two steps back a lot of times, you know, and I, and I realize now that it wasn't so much that I wanted to die. I just didn't know how to live with all of this. You know, these are things that I'd watch on Dateline or something. And then you shut the TV off and you go, oh, my gosh, what a tragic story. And you go to bed and you don't even think about it the next day. And all of a sudden, my life is, is a Dateline episode. And I just I didn't know how to live with that, you know, and that's why I try to work in suicide prevention now. And I, I really feel like so many people. It's not that they don't want to, that they want to die. They just don't know how to live. They don't know how to do that anymore. Mm. And thank, thank God I had that nature and I had an experience with a grizzly bear early on that really pretty quickly changed my mind about all this, you know, seemingly drunken, romantic, suicidal delusions. And I had a, you know, a grizz that lifted its head one time and, and I realized that if he could oblige me of all of those delusions right there and then. And I literally, at that moment, I knew I did not, I didn't want to die. I just, we, we just had to figure out how, what this new life looked like. And, and thank, thank goodness I was in Grizz country. As, as a wildlife photographer, you went face to face with that grizzly bear and also a mountain lion. Uh, two incredible experiences. What did that do to you? The bear and some early bear stuff really changed the trajectory of things. That I, I knew I wanted to live, but I was still using and you know, making <laughs> the life I supposedly wanted to live very difficult. And then I started following job, the, this production company I was working for. We followed a female mountain lion for four years through two litters of kittens. And man, we saw more beautiful amazingness. You know, we even had like people from the Cougar Project reaching out saying, how in the world are, are you guys seeing all these mountain lions? And they're like, well, it's not dogs and it's not telemetry. We get out and get after it. Every day, all day. We missed holidays. We missed everything. If there was a mountain lion I had to kill, too bad for Christmas. See you next year. We had work to do. And it was just a full immersion into it. And for me, anyways, <clears throat> a big part of my recovery was I needed to physically exhaust myself. I needed to come off the trail at the end of the night. I was too tired to think about Marley, to think about my mom, to think about all of that stuff. I fell asleep in my boots a lot of nights, you know, because it was just outside in the fresh air with heavy packs chasing mountain lions through cold Montana winters and just seeing these crazy things, you know, going up the side of a mountain with headlamps on and we're watching people, you know, lights come on at five o'clock in the morning. They go to make coffee and we're already on the trail following mountain lions. And that is exactly what I needed is that that respite, that sanctuary of nature where I was just keyed into the moment. There was no past or no future when you're following a fresh set of mountain lion tracks. And what happened when you came face to face with the mountain lion? Yeah, we fed, had a couple. And then when I, uh, on 12, 15, 18, I got sober on September 4th, 2018. And, and that following December on the 15th, um, I had probably my wildest solo experience and I, I cut some fresh mountain lion tracks and walked this big male down he was drinking out of a creek so he didn't didn't hear me when he turned around we, we locked eyes i kind of wondered <laughs> what he was going to do he just kind of turned around and sauntered off he never even looked back which actually after i consulted some some books on cougar ecology and stuff that's a sign of a really confident animal that he's like <laughs> I'm not even worried about you, picture boy. Like I, I don't even, I don't even give you a second look. No, I say, last I saw was his tail flick and disappear over this rise, and I knew that was a gift for me. Mm -hmm. That was very, very early on in my recovery, and I was white knuckling it. And I had those little wild moments. I saw that grace and that power and that raw wildness, and that mm -hmm. I wanted that for my life. You were white knuckling it, and you were losing your grip at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it, it really, boy, you know. 
I knew I was struggling back then, but probably like everybody in recovery, you look back and you go, oh man, <laughs> I was barely hanging on there for a little bit. Like it was a constant battle. You know, I just had to rewire my brain that when I thought of trauma, I went for my boots instead of the bottle. And it didn't feel right all the time. But if I did it enough, I just felt like if I just keep doing this enough and I just keep doing this enough, I'll rewire my brain that when I feel sad or anxious or depressed, my body will crave the outdoor time instead of that booze. And it worked. You also found serenity beneath that big Douglas fur. Yeah, that was my that was my fit spot. You know, and, and funny story, when I checked myself into, into treatment in um, September of 2018, we were doing... Um, the thing where we go around, everybody says what they do to fill in the void where they used to use. And I said, they, you know, everybody's saying they're kind of canned answers. A lot of them are court ordered in there. And, and they get to me and she says, what's yours? And I said, well, I, I, what I do instead is I, I've been filming these two orphan grizzly bear cubs and I sit under a, an old Douglas fir tree. And she goes, oh, my gosh. Oh, you're into new age healing. And I said, <laughs> new age? Can I tell my crow friends that? <laughs> Can I tell my Native American friends that you, that, you know, following animals, sitting under a tree, thinking about your existence is new age? And I thought that was cute. She's so excited. Ooh, new age. I'm like, well, I said, well, I think what we're trying here with under bad flickering lights and print ups that we can't read is probably more new age. You know, what I was doing is what people have been doing for eons. Pick your religion. You know, yeah. they went to the wilderness for healing, right? That's where that's where they went out of you, almost any world religion. You could you'll find that story of of someone that went out into the wilderness to to find that. As I mentioned uh, off, off the air, I have a, a friend in North Carolina, singer songwriter named Chuck Brodsky, and he wrote a song, "We Are Each Other's Angels," and and the verse is, "We are each other's angels. We meet when it is time. We keep each other going, and we show each other signs." And two of those angels for you were two grizzly bear cubs. Uh, tell me about your relationship with them. Yeah, the orphans. You know, um, and it's interesting. People used to name them, you know, and, and plenty of people give animals names that should be reserved for coffee drinks. You know, oh, there's a little pumpkin spice or something. <laughs> and Doug Peacock, the godfather of grizzly bear conservation, my like my Obi Grizz Kenobi, Doug told me early on when we were doing this film about the orphans that you, you don't name wild animals because it deprives them of the wildness. And so I'd been following these two little orphan grizzly bear cubs. We'd film their mom and them. And the mom was shot by a hunter for standing up. And these two little cubs, we thought they would do them. And the, two of the three made it. And so I've been following them for a couple of years. And then when I got sober is when I was working on this film with Doug Peacock on, on these orphans. And they were, they were kind of my AA meeting because to be out there with them first thing in the morning, I needed to be up super early. And I'd film them after work and after treatment and stuff at night. So there, uh, there are a lot of accountability for me, you know, because if I'm drinking or if I'm using, I'm not going to get my butt up at three o'clock in the morning to be out there by five to film. And so they, I just felt a real connection to them to, you know, feeling like I, I wasn't the protector I needed to be for Marley. I just felt a real sense of like dad for these, for these mm -hmm. little orphan grizzly bear cubs. You know. I'm going to put a link to a video documentary that you produced uh, showing these two young grizzlies, and I'm going to put that in in the show notes. But tell me about Doug Peacock and what you have learned from him over time. You know, it was funny. I, of course, read, you know, in Ed Abbey about uh, George, George Hay Duke and, and read some, some Peacock stuff. And, and um, when I first got to Yellowstone, one of my new friends, my medical doctor and my psychoanalyst I was seeing, all three recommended I read Grizzly Years within like a four or five day period. So I picked up Grizzly Years. I really didn't see what a you know Green Beret medic from Vietnam and I had in common. But once I read it, I realized how much we had in common. And I reached out to Doug and all the crazy, radical, wacky stuff you know that Ed, Ed Abbey has been doing. I, the man I met was soft-spoken and very gentle and very kind and very sincere. You know, and, and everybody knows Doug loves grizzlies, but I I don't think people that don't know him as well don't realize that how much Doug loves humans. He's just a very kind and caring caring person. And for me, it was like sitting at the feet, you know, of of the master and listening to Doug. You know, people do wildlife conservation in their spare time or when they can find time. Doug lives and breathes it. He gets up as soon as he wakes up. It's grizzly bears. He just it's his passion. It's his heart. 
I do anything for him. Doug gave me a mission, you know, being a, a Green Beret. When I first got sober, I think Doug knew that I needed a mission. And so he said, you get out there and film those bears. And I want you to write down where they're going and what they're eating and what they're moving and listen to the scuttlebutt in the community and how are they being perceived. And that's exactly what I needed was a task that was much bigger than me to be involved in. And so I've, I've learned as much about living in life and loving life as I have about grizzly bears from Glenn Peacock. You lived your story. How cathartic was it to write your story? You know, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I've, I've wondered about that several times. And I, I, I'd like to think I'd still be sober, still moving in the right direction. But had I not sat down and wrote that all out, I, I don't know. I, it needed to come out. And it does. It's going to come out one way or another, right? Through addiction, through whatever these things manifest, right? And it's, it's just, I, I really felt like it was, it was very cathartic. Like I was, you know, somewhat like Reagan and the Exorcist or whatever, you know, I just needed, I mean, my first draft was, was pretty much just barf on the page. <laughs> anyway, so I just spit up a bunch of goo and then had a bunch of help from people trying to, trying to figure it out, but it, it needed to come out. And I, I needed some clarity for myself to understand because when we're sober, it's hard enough. So many times we can remember where things ended, but not where they started really. I needed to get back to the start. And this, this book not only took me back through Marley, but you know, I battled addiction before we lost Marley. And I come from a long line of alcoholics. And you know, I'm the, the one that, you know, they used to put beer in the baby bottles for all of us and thought it was funny and cute back in the 70s. You know, family of alcoholics putting booze in the baby's bottles. And then, you know, so I, I had issues already, but the, but the loss of Marley just, any, any restraint I had before was gone. How do you deal with the challenges of everyday life five years since the beginning of your recovery journey? I don't really have any, Neil. You know, I don't have a lot of challenges by design. I've worked very hard to get to a spot where I'm happy in my life. I'm content with what I have. I feel like I, I got a, that second lease. In a lot of days, I'm just so dang happy to be here that, you know, I, I came to realize that I was my biggest problem and I was my only solution. And and once I got the heck out of my own way, I had to retrain my brain, but to, to stop worrying, you know, we get so used to feeling like that other, that second shoe is going to fall. And I think the goal is to quit counting shoes and just breathe and just be here. And so I, you know, any challenges I have these days, the ones I've put in front of myself, you know, I we just work and you know uh, so a beautiful thing about people in recovery i find are so resilient to other things right we realize what is important and what is not important what's worth getting upset and worked up about or what isn't and it's just it's giving, it's giving me such a fresh perspective on not only recovery but just life in general that you know, if i get a little stressed out i look at what what really is eating at me and we just fix it and if you can't fix it just let it go, right? And just have this philosophy of if it moves towards me and I like it, I'm going to move towards it. And if it moves away from me, I'll let it go. As excellent a writer as you are, Brad, please tell me there's more to write, more to share, more to capture, more to film, and more stories to tell. What are you working on now? Yeah. Um, so St. Martin's was part of the first book is they're interested in book two. I think they want to, would like to take a first look at that. And so what I've been thinking is probably another memoir type book, um, more excerpts from the wild. When I went to write book one, I w went to Doug Peacock immediately. And Doug said, use your wild story. All these experiences you've been having, use those as, as you know, your, what drives it. And then the connective tissue is the summary that brings it all together. And so I'd like to do that same thing with, with book two. My focus now is we're doing um, wilderness wellness workshops, just expanding on what I've already been doing and, and doing my own workshops. Now I've got a new partner. And so we're going to be doing this holistic approach to nature-based therapy. And I really want book two to kind of follow that so I can, again, go to some of my stories from the wild um, and then dovetail that with what we're going to learn here, working with people, a lot of people, hopefully, you know, in, in and this wilderness therapy stuff. So I'd, I'd love for that to be kind of a more, the first one kind of touched through the wilderness, kind of touched on that I found healing in nature. The second one, I'd like to do a little deeper dive. What do you say, Brad, to a person much like yourself who's still filled with denial, yet internally is struggling? 
Where is the hope? What do you say to that person? You know, that it really is just about hope and just that, you know, we do get better and we get better together and we stay better together. And I know some of these, all the sayings and stuff that people have in, in recovery may, may seem, you know, a little cliche or, or, or overused, but they're so true is why we continue to use them. Is it that hope, right? And what I found personally is when it's the darkest, 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 one tiny little Bic lighter can illuminate and you know a whole stadium. Really, just a tiny little light in the darkest times is illuminate a, a big area. And, and we do get better, and we can feel better. And I didn't believe it, and I was skeptical, and I thought I was probably one of those guys that quit drinking. And there was a dry drunk that was mad at the world because I had to quit drinking. I love sharing the message because it is such a wonderful transition to feel better to feel loved and to feel connected and you know anybody that that's struggling i just you know my heart goes out to them everything goes out to them if there's any way i can help you know there's ways that people through you or through my website or they're welcome to reach out get a hold of me but it's like we talk about me let's hope hope that we get to get better hope that we can bring that message then full circle, you know, when we start to get better, then we share that and then everyone gets better, just like trauma ripples out, it's health and wellness and hope and love and healing can, can ripple out too. So just hang on and, and get sober and eat some cake and have a good time, right? Like, let's make recovery fun and beautiful and happy and, and just be kids again. So that's, that's my goal for everybody is just to it starts with self-love and you, you, you just, you know, we get sick and tired of being sick and tired and something clicks in you and, and you're ready to go and make a change. How about being around other people who drink? Is that a problem for you? No, not at all. I took a real monastic approach when I got sober. I spent way more time in nature than I did around people. So for several years, I wasn't around it. And then right as I thought I was ready to go out and see the world again, COVID hit. And so then we got kind of locked down some more. And so I've been going out now and quite frankly, I have a few friends and I like it when they don't have drinking problems and I like it when they have one or two and they get a little bit fun, and a little bit goofy and it makes me feel smarter <laughs> and I can, you know, I'm like, Oh, well, uh, you know, I'm better. At com I used to think I was a great conversationalist when I was drinking and now I, I realized that I was just blathering and, and you know, it's, it's good for me to see some people out places that have had too much. And remember that that's, I'm, I'm one beer away from that. Always one beer away. So, it, it really doesn't bother me. I was very fortunate that my crow sister did a ceremony for me years ago. And those cravings were taken from me. You know, like I've, I've never had one since through a divorce, through everything. Through, I just, I don't have cravings anymore. So I can be around it. I can only take so much drunk talk <laughs> right in my face before I have to excuse myself. But it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't trigger anything at all. You know, as a matter of fact, I've, you know, tried to, get some people home or encourage them, you know, maybe that they're, they're probably good for the evening. Water would be good. And, and um, it feels good. It feels good to be able to, to be there for myself and for my brothers and sisters who might, might need it and, you know, let people enjoy. I never, I don't have anything against alcohol, right? I don't, it, it was me that had the issue, not the alcohol. Uh, before we close, I want to ask you one final question. What does recovery mean to you today? Recovery is life. You know, it's, it's everything. It's just, we're here for such a, a short, beautiful time. And, um, it, I, I really honestly feel like I've, like I've been born again. Like I have this outlook again, like I had when I was a kid. I'm excited. I'm curious. I want to be all inspired. That's what re recovery is to me is, is, is my life. I got my life back. Towards the end of your book, you write, eventually I had to come to realize it wasn't the bears the wolves, the lions, the beauty, or the horrors of Yellowstone that saved me. It was love. Love for me, love for you. A love for the infinite web of life we are all in an extricable part of and my place in it. We're all bits of assembled stardust, and everywhere the grizzly bear walks is hollowed ground. Every time my feet share the ground, I am filled with a sense of awe, and I feel Marley right there with me. All is right, if just for a moment. I pause to thank the spirits for all the love around me. I often say recovery is living proof, and Brad, you are living proof. I thank you so much for your time, for your story, for your openness, for recovering out loud.
Thank you, Neil. It's, it's an honor to share, right? And it's just not only an honor, but I feel like it's our duty when we get to a good good place to to help share this message of, of love and hope because it was given to me so freely. So I thank you so much for all you do and, and you know, encouragement to all of your listeners. And if you're struggling, just reach. There's people around you. There's angels all around you ready to ready to help. But you got you got to take that first step yourself. So thank you so much for having me as a guest. You know, it's a real honor and pleasure. And I would love to have you back when it comes to book number two. <laughs> There's more motivation. All right. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Thanks, Neil. Take care, buddy. Well, I hope you enjoyed my interview with Brad. Great guy. His book, by the way, which I highly recommend. A lot of great photos in there of of things in the wild and grizzly bears and mountain lions. Uh, the, the book is called Through the Wilderness, published by St. Martin's Press, easily ordered online at Amazon and other online retailers, and of course also at independent bookstores as well, which we always encourage. And by the way, I want to remind listeners of this podcast that if you would like to tell your story of recovery, regardless of the path that you've chosen, as long as you have been in continuous recovery for a year or more, please drop us a note, recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Coming up next, iconic actor Sir Anthony Hopkins with some reflections on his personal recovery. We'll have that in just 30 seconds. She has always been your baby. But when your daughter got into drugs and alcohol, she turned into a stranger. What do you do? Where do you turn? Contact Sundown M Ranch. Sundown's nationally recognized youth treatment program guides young people back to a life free of drugs and alcohol. All treatment is gender specific and directed by caring certified professionals in a safe environment. You can get your daughter back and get to know her again. Go to www.sundown.org to learn more. And now, as promised, some thoughts on the joys of recovery by an award-winning actor that everybody knows, Sir Anthony Hopkins. He just celebrated another sober anniversary. Hello there. Happy New Year to you all, all you revelers and drinkers and all having fun. Wonderful. Happy New Year. Have a great time. If you get a hangover, remember me. <laughs> I don't get them anymore because 48 years ago today, I stopped. I got help for it and uh, my life changed. Um, I don't envy you having fun out there, but uh, if you need help, day at a time, life is in session. Go for it. Well, that wraps up this edition of Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast. If you've enjoyed our podcast, please share it with others via social media. or Simply tell another friend about it. You can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. If you'd like to drop us an email, get in touch. Our email is recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Remember, if you know or someone who's experiencing problems with alcohol or any other drug, here is a 24-hour national helpline. It offers free information and confidential treatment referrals. Spanish-speaking individuals are available as well. 1-800-622-H-E-L-P. And we encourage you to check out findsupport, one word, dot gov. It's a fairly new website designed for individuals, families, and friends, including how to pay for treatment, how to find low-cost and free treatment options. You'll also find health care support and how to help someone else or find help for yourself. It's all in one place, findsupport.gov. And join us next time for America's Voice for Recovery, Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast. And another shout out to our sponsoring organization, Sundown M Ranch, where recovery begins, sundown.org. Be sure and check out the show notes, by the way, for additional information on our guest today, as well as the review of the new Broadway musical, Days of Wine and Roses. I'm Neil Scott reminding you to stay healthy, live in gratitude, and be kind to others. Remember, the bright side of addiction is recovery. Pass it on.